are Russia and Ukraine on two different timelines? If so, how can Ukraine speed theirs up while Russia tries to slow it down? I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. It's January 30th, 2023. This is your daily Ukraine update. Let's get into it. Okay, first, when we look at the control map, there are no real changes to the front line since the seizure of Blahodatne. This is probably a function of Russian forces consolidating their gains, having and they really want to ensure that they continue to control this highway here um, that can be used to supply Ukrainian forces uh, that are on the defensive. And you guys can see this is a hard defensive line for Ukraine to maintain. There's not much cover, not much concealment, um, not much terrain at all, uh, and there's very few villages or urban areas to allow them to get standoff distance to stop Russian forces. When we look over at the combat map, you guys can see that Russia has really uh, started to consolidate its efforts to continue to exploit uh, any advantages they can along this front line here. They are attacking heavily in uh, Kurdyumivka, trying to expand out there, trying to expand, and it looks like commit an encirclement of Bakhmut despite the fact that this this seems like a really really not great idea to go through uh, a bunch of lowlands with heightened areas like Chasivyar and Bakhmut on either side nonetheless being a tactically unsound decision or at least a decision that will incur a lot of casualties doesn't seem to stop Russia um, they're pushing in Bakhmut, pushing near Cross Nahorda, trying to push out near Solidar and near this cluster of villages north of Solidar. Uh, what's also interesting is that there doesn't seem to be a ton of activity in Volhedar. Um, Mykilsky is also, this is listed as not being under Russian control, uh, whereas in the control map, it does show Mykilsky as being uh, Russian controlled or largely Russian controlled. When we look over at War Mapper, right, he is updating the uh, biggest change, the seizure of Blahodatne, um, and he's indicating that Russian forces seem to be pushing south, right? They really want to try to encircle Bakhmut. They really believe they can make it happen. Um, again, I think it's a really tall order. Um, and when we look at the map, the larger uh, map, you guys can see there's not a ton of changes in the grand scheme of things. Anyway, the biggest question on everyone's mind is, of course, the timeline, right? And one of the things I want to point out is that there have been two different um, methods of warfare employed in this conflict, right? On the Ukrainian side, they are engaging in when they have been on the offensive, what's called maneuver warfare. This is rapid changes in positioning, um, forces that rapidly advance. Uh, but the, the problem with lightning advances like this is they rely, they move too quickly for individual generals, individual planners to issue discrete orders to every commander. Instead, what maneuver warfare relies on is commanders at the highest levels conducting planning and uh, resourcing and a limited amount of forecasting. And then once they engage uh, in this um once they roll out this plan and the execution begins, it falls almost entirely on subordinate leaders to look at the actual situations on the ground, make independent decisions about how to meet the intent of their commander and execute off of that. It requires good leaders at the battalion level and below, all the way down to the squad level. And we've seen maneuver warfare, um, if you have been following the channel at all in many of the helmet cam videos of Civdiv, right? Even though they're not a mechanized unit, you see how they're a squad or platoon sized element. They make individual assessments, decisions. They don't await orders necessarily. They get told what problems to solve and then they go out and solve it as best they can. That is uh, maneuver warfare at its best. Now, Russia, in contrast, engages in what's called positional warfare. Positional warfare is favored by 
countries which do not have mechanized forces um, to rapidly move across the battlefield. It relies on centralized planning. It relies on economies of scale. Um, and that's what Russia is engaging in. The problem is positional warfare is also can be thought of as attritional warfare. Um, you try to gain an improved position on your enemy so that when you engage them, the battles always feel pitched in your favor. Um, it's just a high casualty method of warfare, right? Again, like we saw the Kharkiv offensive is a great case study in maneuver warfare because in the aggregate, um, not only there were a lot of pitched battles, but a lot of this territory was seized without a fight, right? Russian forces were in full retreat, not necessarily staging defense, meaningful defensive operations of any of these regions. They were simply trying to perform a covered withdrawal, right? And so in contrast, right, you look at Bakhmut and we know that Bakhmut probably not going to go down without considerable fighting if it goes down at all. So in positional warfare, you guys have seen the pace is just slower. Uh, Russian forces have been much more uh, plotting in their advances, uh, and you can see they are years away uh, at this pace. Even if they are to continue this offensive operation without stopping, they are years away from seizing any of, from even just retaking the territory that they've lost since the initial invasion. Um, in contrast, though, uh, in maneuver warfare, you generally have decisive sweeping engagements. And again, like the Kharkiv Offensive. The problem is, is that Russia is a big country, several times the size of Ukraine. And that means that it can marshal resources. Positional warfare is also uh, doesn't require high tech anything it doesn't require communi the communications gear the mechanized equipment the coordination between air and ground forces it doesn't require any of that it simply requires people artillery and other firepower and simple plans and the fact is russia has historically been very good at this style of warfare um and it also is able to continually put troops into the field this is sort of its expertise. And so Russia is preparing more and more if we look at some of the news about how they are preparing to sustain their recruitment process. They're looking to reach out to anyone who will provide them military equipment like North Korea or Iran. And they are building these timelines not to get a ton of gear to the front, but to get enough gear to the front to sustain uh a positional warfare for many, many years to come. And the problem is, is that while Russia is still considering whether or not it will mobilize its entire country, Ukraine mobilized its entire population on basically day one. So Ukraine just simply doesn't have the depth of the bench that Russia does in terms of people. In a combat, in a in a war position like what we're seeing, what we've seen in the last maybe 60 days. Uh, this is not Ukraine's war to win. But as we've talked about, when Ukraine can use decisive maneuver warfare, it is hard to stop. And to do that, though, Ukraine needs armored equipment. It needs tracked vehicles. It needs good, even things like communications, right? Uh, the computerized fire direction control centers, the good radios. Um, and well-trained non-commissioned officers, all of which Ukraine is doing. But one of the problems, as Institute for the Study of War repeatedly points out, is that if Ukraine can't get these high-tech systems, their ability to conduct maneuver warfare is going to become more and more limited. Right? Ukraine has said they need around three, to, uh, I think around 500 uh uh, high-end main battle tanks to really launch a decisive operation. Um, it seems like possible that they will get those 500 tanks. Um, and if they can do so, right, they already have a good playbook of how to run a maneuver offensive uh, as long as they maintain a good cadre of non-commissioned officers. And that's why I think ultimately Ukraine isn't engaging in these decisive defensive efforts because that's what Russia wants. It wants to pin Ukraine's best forces, most experienced forces in one place and eliminate them. 
and that way they won't be around to lead the future offensives um, where experienced troops and good leaders are going to be absolutely non-negotiably important. So anyway, guys, that is all I had for you for today. Of course, if you want the uncensored combat video breakdowns, those are all going to be on the Patreon. Thanks so much to my lieutenant tier patrons. You guys are the ones who make this whole thing uh, possible. Um, and I will see all you guys in the next one.